Good afternoon. Um, welcome to another episode of the Entree. Today's guest is Alicia Harvey. She is the CEO of Distinct Tax. She is an enrolled agent and CTP as well. Alicia, welcome to the show. Hi there, Cameron. Thank you. I appreciate that. Very welcome. Alicia, we've spoken offline and, you know, you've got me really excited about what you do. But I was obviously want to tell our listeners a little bit more about you. So how about you tell us how you got into your career? Man, it's it's definitely been a journey, but uh, it actually started with a friend and she called. She was in a panic and she said, oh, my goodness, Alicia, my bank account has just been garnished by the IRS. And I said, wait, the, the IRS garnished your bank account? And just knowing the process behind the scenes, I was like, it couldn't have been the IRS, right? So um, getting the backstory from her, um, she actually flew to California just to visit, but then ended up staying a little while and started working. Um, did not understand the residency, non-residency rules when it comes to tax. And so she worked um, for a company out in California, but did not file the tax return. Well, the, the funky thing about it is some of your states are way more uh, gruesome, way more efficient and quicker than the IRS. So when you don't file a return, they'll give you, you know, a little bit of time. And then once the extension deadline hits and you haven't filed, they're more than likely going to file that return for you. And that's exactly what California did. Mm -hmm. um, and they filed the return. Uh, she did not pay the balance that she owed, and then she changed addresses. So she didn't file the address change, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were so many different things that happened um, in between that. So it ended up garnishing her bank account, mm -hmm. um, personal and savings and the business. Yeah. Everything was wiped clean. And yeah. so, of course, you can imagine going grocery shopping. You know the money was there from yesterday, and it was it was there. And you're like, okay, I'm going to wake up and go grocery shopping. Well, it wasn't there anymore. And she screamed the IRS because that's the first thing everyone screams, but it was actually the California um, Tax Franchise Board, mm -hmm. right? And so um, that really freaked her out. And it took us a, a good minute to um, get that situation handled and cleared. But in the meantime, while we were trying to do that, she was referring so many people over. She said, oh my goodness, she's helping me. And, you know, she's just so oh good. Um, and at that point, I realized that I enjoyed helping people and I didn't feel fulfilled in the role that I was in at my um, current job at the time. And I just knew there was more that could be done. So I started making my exit plan. Um, and But in the meantime, they kind of made it for me, right? They let me go, gave me severance. Um, and it was enough to last uh, my household for almost about six months. So I said, wow, this is a huge blessing, right? And so now I can, I don't have to worry about the bills. I don't have to worry about making sure the mortgage is paid and all that other stuff and putting the burden on my husband. You know, I just, I, I didn't have to do all that. And I was like, hey, we have some cushion. And at that point, I had the ability to focus on the business and not worrying about my personal life and the business life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, here we are 10 years and some months later. Excellent. So 10 years as a tax advisor. A qualified one as well. Um, just out of interest, what did you do before? Yeah, man, I've always been in the accounting industry. So I started um, as a bookkeeper and um, pretty much executive assistant uh, for a staffing agency. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went to college, worked in the financial and fiscal bazaars office um, at the university for Savannah State University. Mm -hmm. Then left there, went for a CPA firm. Okay. And I handled accounts payable, accounts uh, receivable, uh, bookkeeping, and, and sales and use tax returns. Then left that, kind of got bored. I felt like I mastered the whole thing, got bored with that, and went into auditing mm -hmm. um, banks and credit unions. And I enjoyed it for a minute, but for anyone who understands accounting and auditing, I'm not a fan of materiality. I just feel like it's just way too much room for error. You know, and I, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. So I, I stuck it out for about a year and some change. Um, and I actually went back to the company I left and uh, went back in the tax and business advisory department mm -hmm. where we um, handled the business returns, the personal returns, 
and uh, did business advisory for them on, you know, forming your business, selling your business, um, pretty much the whole gambit. Mm -hmm. And um, after I started getting into that and started meeting with some clients, it wasn't many at that time. um, I then realized and said, I could do this. I, I, I got this. And I was already working with um, my own set of clients mm-hmm. outside of that, even before, you know, I went back to them. So mm-hmm. um, at that point, I said, you know, it's just a matter of time in order for me to grow. I, I got to be able to leave. And that's when I started my exit plan. But it went a different way. Excellent. So you've always been in accounting. Um, but, you know, just sort of explain to people the difference between uh, I see here you're an, an enrolled agent. Uh, the difference between the bookkeeper and enrolled agent and a CPA, so they sort of understand. Yeah, there's there's a big difference, um, but subtle, depending on the person you're talking to, um, which can be very confusing. Um, so in in a perfect world on a book text, right? So the bookkeeper doesn't necessarily have a degree or any type of education. They may have a certification um, to be like a certified bookkeeper where they understand the debits and credits mm-hmm. and how to record um, transactions. Um, but again, there may be someone in today's society that has a degree and they just choose to do bookkeeping, right? So you always have to complete your due diligence there. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, an enrolled agent is a federal license um, through the IRS. Same situation. The person may or may not have any type of degrees. Um, They can get the license without any type of education of a bachelor's or a master's degree, right? So again, just double checking with the person and getting um, that information of what degrees do they have, what certification, what other certifications do they have? Um, But someone who's an enrolled agent, they have the ability to represent any taxpayer um, across the United States. There's no jurisdiction restrictions. Um, We can handle all states. Now, then you have um, your CPA. Now, your CPA is a person that you know they have um, some type of education, right? At least a bachelor's degree, possibly a master's degree, right? Um, And then, of course, they took that exam. They get a license um, based off of the exam they took at that state. Mm -hmm. Um, With the CPAs, a lot of them, depending on the states they want to practice in, they'll go and get a license out of those states so that they can be compliant. Um, they may not have to take an exam, but they can um, they can surely uh, handle, you know, all of, all of the things depending on their specialty. Mm-hmm. Now, um, to kind of dive a little bit more into that, not every CPA handles tax, right? They not, they're not going to handle audit. They may not handle accounting. Some of them may just focus on estate planning. Some may just focus on selling your business, buying businesses. Um, that's the the amazing thing, the versatility of a CPA, right? And I know a lot of us just automatically assume that the CPA specializes in whatever I need them to do because they're all the things. Um, and so they know a little bit about everything, but what their specialty is, that's where that due diligence um, on your end comes in at, right? And so knowing what questions to ask, how to ask them, right? Those are so, so important. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course, when if we relate this to say like the medical industry, everyone mm-hmm. understands that pretty pretty clearly, right? So you have your, your internist, you have a family practice, there's a surgeon, but then there's different levels of surgery, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same way in the accounting industry. If you go for an enrolled agent, do they specialize in tax preparation, tax planning, tax resolution, mm-hmm. right? So those those three. Same thing with CPAs. Do they, um, sorry, do they focus or specialize in tax? Um, and then of course, what levels of tax, right? Because I just gave you three different levels of tax. Do mm-hmm. they um, focus in financial accounting and bookkeeping? But then you have for profit, you have non profit, then within the for profit, you have um, your large, mid size, and small businesses, mm-hmm. right? So there's niches severely, right? And then it, you can go deeper by industry. So um, it's, it's, you know, easy to say it's, it's not an easy thing to pick who to go with, yeah. right? Because if they specialize in all the things, that means they have a huge team, mm-hmm. 
right? If it's a smaller team, I cannot expect that they can specialize in everything that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all about asking the right questions and knowing, you know, is the synergy there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. Um, and so what you're really saying is when you go out to look for an accountant, because anyone can be an accountant, uh, but you're a bookkeeper, or a CPA, uh, an enrolled agent, it's sort of in those type of pillars. You really need to drill down and find out what their particular niche is. And so you understand whether they can help you. So if you're going under wills and probates, you need to find an accountant that actually looks after estate planning. If you're looking for sort of um, tax returns, you need to find out, uh, get a tax specialist. And that's literally what you're saying is, please do your homework, because if you don't, you might end up with a great accountant, but that one that doesn't actually specialize in your field and so may not be as effective as you want them to be. And to get more bang for your buck or for your dollar, should we say, please kind of do your research. Um, and that's really good. That's really good um, insight. I, I mean, I found myself studying accounting because as we talked offline, um, I was always presented with my books uh, and I get the T accounts. So I look at the T accounts, you know, debits and credits. Uh, and the numbers at the bottom never really made any sense to me. Um, are we making money or are we not making money? Why do we keep pumping money to the business? Uh, we seem like we're growing, but we have a very small profit margin. And I got really frustrated with the project managers. Um, and this is from the real estate side of business. Um, I literally just went and started to read accounting. Um, and it's been probably the most beneficial thing for me as a founder, because I now understand mm -hmm. the basics, not to say I want to replace someone like yourself, but it's for you as a, a small business or medium sized business, just to understand what a professional like you is talking about. Um, and that's sort of like where, how I kind of got into understanding the different niches. So I, 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 everything you say resonates with me and I hope it resonates with the audience as well. I think what's also important is, you know, if we talk about small businesses and you mentioned the California state franchise fee, um, I found myself as a, a new business in North America. I got the Delaware franchise fee. Um, mm -hmm. and Right. And as you know, yeah. as you mentioned, it's a pre-calculated figure initially. So when I got it. Um, it was like, well, hang on a second. We don't owe you guys this money. <laughs> Where did you get this number from? And so if you could explain what that is for a small business owner that's listening, that would be, that'd be nice. Absolutely. Um, so the, the biggest thing about that, they're calculating off of the gross that mm -hmm. they can identify or verify, right? So we live in the world of technology you know, electronic currency is passing through the banks. People are using credit cards, things of those sorts. So they have the ability to go in and if they need to, right, they don't necessarily need all these different types of warrants and things like that. Um, but they can go in and see um, either what was reported under the business or the personal, right? But mostly the business, if you're getting that right. Um, and they don't know what expenses you have. What they do know is how much money you made. And that number, that pre-calculated number is based off of the gross sales that they believe you have. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, you know, the compliance, but the planning aspect is so important because that is where if you don't properly record information or register in the states properly um, and to have that those due dates on your calendar, or someone watching those due dates, what's gonna end up happening, same thing that happened with you, Cameron, you're gonna get a notice that says, oh, you owe us $5,000. And you're like, whoa, hold on, I don't owe you 5,000. I have expenses, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. So let's say you know that half a million dollars that you made and you had expenses of say 400,000 and now the net is 100,000, well, they probably just, you know, that 5,000 now, it should have just been 1,000 instead of five, right? And so it's going to be very important that when you do receive those notices, respond as quickly as possible, especially by the deadline, right? Ideally before the deadline to give them some time for processing. We know how the states operate, right? Mm -hmm. They need some time. They are um, some of those 
um, state workers. We know how that goes. Um, but yeah, you ultimately, you got to have record keeping. And mm -hmm. some people, you know, believe, oh, I have my bank statements. No, record keeping includes the bank statements. It includes the receipts. It includes <clears throat> your financial statements and your accounting software, whichever one you do choose, because there's several out here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's all of those things, including the compliance aspect, because mm -hmm. you registered with the IRS, you registered with the state, but then keep in mind, you may have to register with the county or the city that you're operating out of. Right. That's Depends a whole nother, you know, a whole nother gambit that many business owners forget. Um, mm -hmm. And because we have a world of I work from home mm -hmm. and I work remotely or I telework, whatever your term is, many of them don't even register their business that works from home. They're like, oh, I don't have brick and mortar. Well, each county, each city now has a home-based business worksheet. And even though you may not pay as much as someone who has brick and mortar, but you have the ability to still be compliant. Because one thing you don't want to do is not register, not pay your business, um, your business license tax, right? And then they come to your house, shut you down and, and cite you with penalties and fees. And then you do that enough, guess what they do? They ban you from operating at all in their county. And that's a whole nother issue. Oh, I think you're muted. That actually leads me on to my next question, right? So my next question is, so you get your bill. It's the 31st of March. You forgot about it. Mm. Um, you're now 25th of April. And you're like, oh, man. I had to do this, or I needed to call Alicia. What do you then do? Yeah. Do? Well, definitely call your accountant, right? Um, mm -hmm. You can call us as well, but definitely call your accountant because mm -hmm. at that point, mm -hmm. um, it's pre pretty much like Russian roulette. Try to get the information to the county or to the state um, or to the city as quick as possible. And unfortunately, many of our cities and states in the United States are paper-based, which means you got to physically take it. Yes. And physically taking things with traffic and whatever may be, you know, in the way, it may not make it. it so, yeah. right, it may not make it on time. So um, sometimes, as long as you can make it to the post office and you can get post stamped, Mm -hmm. for that day you're okay yeah right um but many of us don't have that option here in atlanta we yeah. have a post office that's open until midnight right wow. um and that's every day except sunday so we have the ability to at least still go get it stamped for today yeah. right but every every city and county doesn't have that and Even so 35 in atlanta <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, you know, it's just one of those things that um, when it does happen, let's say you you can't go to the post office. Well, now you have to be ready for penalties and interest mm -hmm. on any balance that you had due, say on the 31st or the 1st, right? Um, because, you know, like those business licenses, they're due on the 1st of April, right? Yeah. And so if that's not filed, then... They're going to add interest by the day, by the week, or by the month. Every county is different. Mm -hmm. um, and you can try to abate them, but I will tell you it's nearly impossible to abate them. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it's for hospitalization, a death in the family, um, even if you're incapacitated, someone should have still filed it. And I know it sounds so harsh. It's like, man, they're, they're not budging. They're not. Yeah. Right? We We all understand from... Um, from some type of political standpoint, many counties, they operate on their budget. And if they don't meet the, you know, the revenue that they're supposed to have, they're, they're in a deficit. So um, they're not wavering on any interest um, yeah. or late fees. That's good to know. I mean, for us, I mean, we, 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 we've done ours, but it's more for those that are listening, because there's many small businesses out there, uh, all me kind of small to medium who don't know this um, or just missed that point. And it's so important that you can avoid 
these penalties and what they've started doing in the UK is it's based on a point system now. So if you're late five times, then you get a fine. So you get a penalty each month, you're late, you get one point. So the fifth time you get a fine, I think it's about four or $500, but each time it goes up in increments. And, you know, if you can keep your house in order, as you mentioned, um, have a good accounting system, have some good software, whether it's QuickBooks or Sage, um, Zero, there's many out there, you can obviously avoid these problems and just having a calendar um, with the dates in, maybe have it done a week or two before, a month before, and keep having sort of periodic reminders that will then help you check in with your tax person and ensure that things are done the right way. Um, but there's an interesting thing on your profile that I noticed, right? And it went something along the lines of, I can help you transform your tax bills and turn them into income producing assets. Now I'm intrigued. So I want you to tell me a bit more. Absolutely. Um, a quick answer is tax planning and strategy, right? Okay. Um, it's one of those things that it's it's now becoming a a known thing that you should participate in tax planning and strategy. Whereas, mm -hmm. say pre COVID, a lot of people thought this was for the rich. Mm -hmm. right? But then, as people are sitting at home recording videos, TikTok blows up. Right mm -hmm. now, people are like, "Oh man, I need to do tax planning." Right. And so tax planning is ultimately the way that we can ultimately say, hey, I'm going to tell the IRS that I only want to pay them $100,000. But then the question is, how do we do that? Instead of the IRS telling me to pay them 300000 right? Mm -hmm. So ultimately, you are writing your own check to the IRS, but mm -hmm. keeping most of your money for yourself and for your business so that at that point, it's about how you're making your money and mm -hmm. not how much you're making, mm -hmm. right? And so now we we take the cash because cash, a lot of people say cash is king, but mm -hmm. cash is text, right? We don't want that. Mm -hmm. Now, what we need to do is to take that cash mm -hmm. and now we need to invest it somewhere, right? We'll mm -hmm. get the money back. We'll just get, get it back a different way. Mm -hmm. And the way we get it back it's tax less than what it would be today, right? Okay. Um, but of course, whenever I like to give all the good stuff, but I want to give the realistic as well, right? Yeah. So if we're working on tax planning, cash flow for the business and your personal are very important. Mm -hmm. We cannot be so tax plan heavy mm -hmm. to the point where your business nor personal can operate on its own independently, mm -hmm. right? And then next thing you know, you start cashing out on all these assets that we put in place, that we purchased, that we bought, that are now creating additional income for you. It just may not be creating the amount of income you, you need right now. Oh, wow. So, Correct. you know, if we have say $100,000 in the bank today, but mm -hmm. your business operates on $30,000 every month, mm -hmm. if anything were to happen to your business where income just stops, Right. Mm -hmm. So take back to maybe about April of 2020. Right. Mm -hmm. Several businesses had no income. Business just stopped. Yeah. Right. If you don't have cash reserves. Then the no one can be paid. Right. Even for the work that's been done. Nothing can be nothing can run. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, your cash reserves are what's so important to allow you to still run for at least three to six months mm -hmm. until things pick up. Mm -hmm. Well. If you have that, say, 100,000, 90,000 of that is going to hold you for three months. Mm -hmm. I would not want to touch that 90. Mm -hmm. Right. So that ultimately is telling me that we have maybe about $10,000 to invest to help minimize our tax liability. Will that be enough for your current situation? Maybe yes or no. Right. Um, unless you, you know, we have to, we have to really think about the other income that you have coming in, right? So that accounts receivable. We have to look at that. Uh, we also have to look at your current retirement plans, mm -hmm. right? Um, are they best suited for you? Uh, we work together with financial advisors and planners that have been in this industry at least 20 years. Uh, we do have some that are roughly at about the 10-year mark, but um, 
that are just as good. Again, one of those things of knowing the niche and, and where they are. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we work with them to get the specific accounts that work best on the tax side, but also on the um, on the other side to make sure that um, the income is being produced, right? So that's retirement accounts. We also have re uh, real estate, right? So real estate is another way. And I know some people are thinking like, oh, I'll just go out there and buy these townhomes and buy these multiplexes, duplexes or whatnot. And that's not necessarily the case, right? So there's various investments when it comes to real estate. It could be farms. It could be solar farms. It could be um, other things. Because what we're looking for are certain tax credits that we can get over time, mm -hmm. right? But we're also looking for these various investments that are going to pay you every year, mm -hmm. right? So I have one investment um, that comes to mind. And it's ultimately um, invested into oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And I know some people are like, oh, well, I could just go buy a stock in oil and gas. Well, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. That you own just a, a minute piece when you mm -hmm. go and buy 100 stocks or whatnot. We're not talking about that. I'm not talking about your stock shares. I'm talking about ownership shares, right? And the same way as in your business, mm -hmm. that's the same as, you know, owning a piece of the oil and gas business. So mm -hmm. there's several companies out here and it's actually regulated by Congress, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people don't even know about it. And a lot of times we don't even know how much is eligible to be purchased every year until nearly the end of third quarter, early fourth quarter, mm -hmm. because they have to release on how much is available. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that it's like, if you know, you know, if you're in the in crowd, then you know, if yeah. you're not in the in crowd, it's like, why would I never know about this? Right. And, you know, there's different levels and barriers of entry for that sole purpose. Yeah. Right. And so I have um, some some connections where the lowest barrier of entry is twenty five thousand. There's mm -hmm. some that's at one hundred thousand. Right. So ultimately, you you would initially think, oh, well, that's where the rich can play. I can't pull out twenty five thousand. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but again, with the tax planning, we're finding ways that instead of paying the IRS three hundred, can we pay them one hundred? Can we pay them fifty? Mm -hmm. And if you were to tell me. Um, today, Cameron, and you said, hey, by this time next year, when I file my twenty twenty three return, I only want to pay the IRS roughly maybe about 30000 mm -hmm. I will put a plan together and let you know that, hey, Cameron, we're going to tackle this type of real estate investment, this type of um, retirement investment, this type of estate planning, this type of this. And I would break it down within all of the categories of tax planning. Mm -hmm. right? And that will give you pretty much the blueprint as to what it is that needs to be done. Now, once I give you the plan, it's just like estate planning, right? When people create a trust, if you don't put it into action, it's just an expensive sheet of paper, right? Mm -hmm. But the great thing is towards the back of the plan, it we are ultimately telling you who you need to work with or how can we implement this? Mm -hmm. I'm a big, um, I'm, I'm really big on if there's something that we have a template for that I've fought the IRS with, I'm mm -hmm. going to give it to you and say, okay, here, Cameron, this is the template you're going to use. Change your, your company information to it. Send it to me for, for review. We can make some edits and changes. Implement this. You can start spending this type of money and moving it here, right? Because mm -hmm. once we move the money, there has to be a plan on how to get it out or reinvest it somewhere else, right? Because it's all about jumping over from cash into assets. So um, that's the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. And I know for me, I haven't I haven't had to pay um, since I've been full time as a business owner. I think the most I've ever paid was maybe about 20,000 altogether. Mm -hmm. And so um, for business owners that are uh, that are operating in, you know, high efficiency companies or high income producing companies, $20,000 is nothing. No. Right. And I and again, I've been in business for 10 years. So yeah. when I say roughly about 20,000, I mean, we're really talking about pennies on the dollar here. So yeah. um, it's a big deal. 
right? Mm -hmm. As long as you, you implement it. But I also want to share the reality of it, right? Mm -hmm. Tax planning is like working out, mm -hmm. right? We don't go from 600 pound life to weighing 250 pounds by just dropping off and showing up at the gym, right? It's a combination of things, right? There's certain workouts you have to do. There's certain foods that you need to eat and not eat, right? So that's, that's something that you have to work on daily, maybe even three times a week. Tax planning is the same way. It is indeed. And this actually sounds like the conversation we had offline when I said to you, hey, I blocked out seven till 10 each day so I can work out, get back to where we need to be, um, eat, eating the right foods, et cetera. So I think... What you've given us there is a lot of detail and information, and I, I'm, I'm going to come back to that point there. But if I sort of ex also explain it in my way is literally what you're saying here is that, look, um, run your business like a business, but also as an individual, run your life as if it's a business, because this is not some type of avoidance scheme or a wrongdoing. It's literally information that is out there for you. And if you go to Alicia, she will tell you exactly what you need to do. So if you do have a hundred thousand dollar bill, yes, that's great. You can pay Mr. IRS. Alternatively, if you wanted to buy a building, per se, that could potentially reduce your hundred thousand liability and so forth. Um, there are a lot of people on social media that talk about, hey, buy a car because it's 300 pounds weight and et cetera. These are all great ideas, but my sort of recommendation to those that are listening is really talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. And if you actually do plan, from my, from my experiences, if you do actually plan effectively, not only are you reducing that $100,000 bill, but you're also giving your business the opportunity to grow in other, in other ways as well. So as a an accountancy firm, at least, you know, you've just bought the building, you're now on real estate, you might have the top floor vacant, which you can rent to another business and so forth. And now you, you know, you do not just have a business, you have companies. Um, so those that do do hear this, please do reach out to her. Um, she's obviously um, credible on your side of the, uh, the ocean and will be able to give you a lot more insight on that. But I actually second what you said there as well because i've experienced it myself um and that being said we planned you know our business you know we've got some efficiency going on in our business how do you sort of relate that to those who are freelancers now as we as you mentioned they're working from home they have a home office but they are having income coming in how can they benefit from such advantage um, um strategies yeah, and so you're saying that they they don't have income coming in. Oh, no, they have income coming in. So you've got a freelancer doesn't have a maybe has an LLC or okay. maybe does not have an LLC, but they still have to at one point in time they may have to declare. So imagine I've been going for a year, a year and a half, and I realized that oh, actually, I do have to pay tax. How do I now present myself to you know Mr. IRS and say right, I do want to pay you ten thousand dollars in tax. But at the same time, I have these assets within my home office or et cetera, meetings, whatever. How do I justify and prove that, you know, this is you know, a legitimate business and I'm not trying to avoid paying 10000 Yeah. So, it, of course, it always starts with accounting and bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. um, many freelancers either they're like, hey, I don't make that much money or it's not consistent. That's usually the, the consensus, right? The money's not consistent. You know, I'll get a $20,000 check here or a 10 here. And it's like, oh, I don't know what, um, I don't know what to do and how to manage my money, right? And so that's where um, you have softwares like Wave, there's FreshBooks, um, QuickBooks is probably more on the expensive side now. It used to be one of the most affordable ones. It's still, you know, sort of affordable depending on how much you make, right? And how much you spend. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have accounting suite. Not many people talk about that, um, but it's mostly for your e-commerce, right? But it's, it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. So you have several options. That's your step number one 
is mm -hmm. getting the accounting and bookkeeping together. Um, you got to be able to track your your miles. I know a lot of um, different apps are out there. Even some of your accounting softwares now will will track the the miles that you drive. Mm -hmm. um, but that's usually going to be one of your biggest tax deductions, and and it's all about record keeping, which also ties into tax planning. Tax planning is all about record keeping. Um, again, to to reference uh, in in this that we all understand is attorneys, mm -hmm. right? Um, attorneys handle a lot of paperwork. They handle, you know, everything they do is about documentation, documentation, what they can prove, right? Your situation with the with the IRS and the state is the same exact way. Mm -hmm. What can we prove? Is this expense deductible? Is it absolutely necessary um, for you to operate your business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so understanding what deductions and tax credits that you are eligible for based off of your industry or location, sometimes your circumstance, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's some, um, there's some, what do you want to call it? Um, there's some grace given, right? I, I'll call it grace. Some of it can be tax credits. Some can be a deduction. Um, some can be an extension of time, right? So, um, Let's say you are maybe like a, a part of a domestic violence case, right? Mm -hmm. There's some exceptions and grace given to domestic violence um, victims out there, right? If you're blind, there's a tax credit for that, right? So based off of your circumstance, there may be some situations. And I know it's, it's very tough mm -hmm. to be honest and open with someone about your situation, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just like going to the doctor, going to the lawyer, and they're like, what's the truth? Don't lie to me, right? Your accountant, your tax professional or tax strategist, um, planner or coach, which is, you know, the same thing as I have a certified tax coach and certified tax planner. Um, you need to have a great relationship with someone to be able to share that information with them. Um, because if you just give them part of the story, you're only going to get part of your solution that you really need. Um, you know, same thing. You go to the doctor and you don't share everything that's wrong. They can only treat one thing. And next thing you know, they create another issue because you didn't share everything with them. So mm -hmm. you just want to make sure that the documentation is key. Um, and then the last thing I'll share is you got to stop commingling funds, right? We got to keep it separate, right? So Cameron, you you gave a great example of, you, you still have to treat your personal life as business, right? And I know many of us um, in, in across the world, right? I'll say across the world because I have staff in different countries as well. But across the world, a lot of us were not taught on how to treat our household like a business or mm -hmm. how to treat our life, how we run it as a business, which is why we have so much dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Right. in in so many different areas. Right. None of us are perfect. But if we all operated our personal life as a business at that point, um, planning and paying less in tax would be so much easier. Right. It would be part of your routine. It wouldn't necessarily be something that's an afterthought after you just paid a hundred thousand um, dollars. And, you know, with the, the freelancers, you know, it's so easy. For you all to give up on tax deductions because you didn't record anything. There's no documentation. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had um, a freelancer tell me, oh, Alicia, I don't have that. Oh, man, do we have something else I can give you? And I instantly said, you need to have at minimum a bookkeeper. I don't care how much money you make. Right now, the bookkeeper that you want to hire may not be the one you can afford to hire, but you can work towards that. Mm -hmm. right? um, but again, that due diligence check is going to be so important. Um, if you understand bookkeeping at minimum, you possibly can get away with handling it yourself. Um, but I would tread lightly mm -hmm. because you may or may not understand what's truly deductible. And you may end up putting something into office supplies that was really personal. And it may not be intentional. Sometimes it is. Right. But um, it may not be intentional. And then you give that information or that 
that summarized document to your tax professionals, CPA, enrolled agent, whoever it is, you give it to them. We're not double checking the details of the numbers you gave us. That's right. 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 And because we're not double checking that, there's a ton of room for error. And next thing you know, one to three years later, you're in a pickle. You received a notice that says you cannot deduct any of the stuff that you put on your return. Right. Because the numbers, some uh, some people don't understand that the numbers are red flags. Right. We look at portions and proportions. Right. Percentages. Of, you know, total revenue, total expenses, all of that is considered in in the calculation. They look at the history of what you've been doing and the stuff that you put on your return. It may not be a lie. But the thing is, can you prove it Mm. at the end of the day? If you can't prove it, Mm -hmm. then more than likely it did not happen. Um, There are exceptions that can be made, but for the most part, you have to, you know, document, document, document. If nothing else, even if it's unorganized, I need documentation at minimum. The organization can come. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's really good. And that's so true. It really is so true. Um, And I guess a lot of freelancers don't realize this uh, until it's too late. But Mm -hmm. it's, you know, having a bookkeeper is can be expensive, depending. But if you're smart and you sort of have QuickBooks or, I don't know, Azure or whatever, you can literally just plug it into your bank account, as we talked about earlier offline. Download the app, plug it in. If everything's run through the banking system, you can get a bookkeeper to pull that statement at the end of the month or the quarter, whatever it is, and really go through these numbers and just come back to you and say, hey, what is this? What is that? Um, And what a lot of people don't realize is that the bookkeeper does all the hard work, you know, on the ground and the accountant submits it at times. Um, So as you mentioned, the accountant's not really going to be checking, but they are reliant upon that information to be correct. And one of the most easiest ways to do so is to use uh, a piece of software as much as you can take pictures of the receipts i mean some of these have you know take a picture of the receipt and it sort of just pulls it into the software um, and does all the calculations for you at the end of the month so i mean do look into that what i do want to ask you though right is imagine i'm a business or i'm i'm a freelancer now as we've talked about and we've been going a year or so and I've now set myself self up as LLC or S Corp one. But prior to becoming a freelancer, it took me maybe, maybe a year or two to get the business going. Mm-hmm. So I would have had expenses, you know, maybe doing research and development, all of this type. Now, are there ways to actually then say, well, hey, I didn't actually start my business in 2023. I started in 2020, 2020 because the idea and the concept began then, and we started spending money on travel to meetings and conferences to get the information or the equipment booked or, or built, sorry, or whatever. Um, and so now I'm at 2023 wanting to present my accounts. Can I include, and you you know where I'm going with this, right? Can I include the build up to now what is profit a profitable business or potentially a profitable business? Um, and if so, how would we go about this? Just just a little synopsis. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I gave you a little bit of my, my background, but I didn't tell you specifically what it was in, right? Oh. And so it, it, it all ties together, right? Mm-hmm. So when I, my first CPA um, job or firm I worked at um, focused on McDonald's franchises, right? And so we all understand what happens you know, at least, you know, a little bit of the process that ground has to be broken, pipes have to be installed, foundation has to be laid, walls have to be put up, right? Mm-hmm. And then the decoration, right? The, um, all the, what do you call it? The paint, the brick, the the arches, all of that stuff has to be put up, right? And then you got the inside, the kitchen, the seating area, um, the cash registers, all that good stuff. Well, to your point, can we include it? Absolutely, right? But it has to be under certain guidelines. Mm-hmm. So that McDonald's franchise, 
well, franchisee, excuse me. So that McDonald's franchisee uh, worked with, you know, the, the headquarters of McDonald's and they found a location, right? All of this work usually starts up to about a year before the McDonald's even opens, right? Can we write that stuff off? Absolutely. That's, again, documentation. Right. So they have all these expenses that they started incurring up to about a year before the official open date. Um, then you had to pay deposits to the contractors. You had to buy the all the materials. Then you had to hire staff. You had to train them. Mm -hmm. Right. To get you ready for grand opening. Mm -hmm. Now. I use that word grand opening. Right. Or official opening. You have to have all of this stuff documented. So if you started incurring, say, one to two years, three years, however long it took, right, hopefully it doesn't take too long, but how long it took, you got to make sure you keep track of what you spent, how much you spent, who you paid, why did you pay them, and then at that point, on the official day of opening, if you do a grand opening with ribbon cutting and all that stuff, all the expenses can be included on the day of opening, right? And we don't necessarily have to go back a couple of years, two or three years to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, you do need an accountant, a bookkeeper. Yes, they can keep track of it for you. But to properly record that, you do need an accountant that understands that concept. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, not every accountant understands that concept or has the training to do so. Um, if your business has a brick and mortar of some sort, then at that point, there's a cost segregation study that is needed, right? Mm -hmm. If you are a service-based industry that, you know, you work where your computer is, but mm -hmm. you have research and development um, expenses and maybe um, staff training, or maybe there were some um, contractors and outsourced work that you paid for to get yourself together, right? Many people may pay for a website, pay for PR and, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, all of that has to be recorded properly. Mm -hmm. Some things, which is very unfortunate, it's not fair, but it's the law. Um, mm -hmm. Some things will require you to amortize that over a 15-year period. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal, but it's it's an option, right? So some people will never share that they started up, right? Because they don't want to get to the cap of having to amortize over a 15-year period. Right. Because you spent the money a year two, three years ago or just now, but then you don't get the deduction. Right. So let's just say easy fifteen thousand dollars was spent. Um, and that was we already reached our cap at five thousand um, of startup expenses. So total is twenty thousand. That other fifteen thousand has to be spread over 15 years. So that's a thousand dollars a year. That's unfair. Nobody wants that. Right. So I have several clients that will never admit, right? And I, I find out eventually as we see how things unfold, but initially we may not see it if you know how to mask it properly. I'm not here to tell you how to mask it, but um, they will mask it as, as well as they can, right? Um, and then at that point, I will say, hey, we need to amend the return that we mm -hmm. filed to properly record your startup expenses. And they're like, what? So now at that point, we wrote off that whole 15000 initially when it should have been amortized. Right, right. right. So and, what he's saying is they put it in forward as current rather than putting it and putting it in as what it should be. Um, correct. That's interesting. But yeah. the, the thing, I suppose that the, the, the key thing here is not, not more so that them doing wrong is them actually understanding the right way to do things um, and as you mentioned earlier if you put something in office supplies when it's personal or personal when it should be office supplies it could really mess up your numbers and it makes a difference between a return from the irs or a payment to the irs um, yeah. and so it's very important for us to to ensure that we put the numbers in correctly but what's interesting as well and something i'm really glad that you know you've shared is those people listening who have started a business or did start a business uh, and maybe failed or are failing or are struggling there is an opportunity 
for you to speak to someone like Alicia and say, hey, look, you know, I put in 20,000 into this business. I'm only making $1,000 a month now, but I've got, you know, 30 or 40 grand in deep. There could potentially be a way to maybe recoup some of that revenue and put it back into your business. But again, I'm not the professional here. You may have to reach out to Alicia to talk to her about that. So tell me, what types of businesses do you really like to work with? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so my company, we specialize in agencies, right? Mm -hmm. And so even though there are probably, I would say at least 75 to 90% of companies who are actually agencies, right? Mm -hmm. To define what is an agency, right? And so an agency is ultimately someone who is organizing a transaction or a series of transactions between two parties, right? So we ultimately kind of um, automatically go to, oh, there's a collection agency, travel agency, staffing agency, but they may not call themselves agencies. Mm -hmm. um, but that's ultimately who who we do work with. Um, if you are, you know, that person that, you know, conducts or controls um, transactions between two or more parties, you are considered an agency. Um, of course, we always have a secondary um, in a, you know, a, a backup industry. Um, we have medical professionals as our secondary. And then um, surprisingly, most people don't know, but the entertainment industry, we have quite a few uh, producers and um, producers for music or producers for acting, mm -hmm. right? So um, those are our top three, but um, agencies are our number one. Excellent, excellent. So tell us a fun fact about you. Oh, so I I'm definitely not your typical accountant. Yeah. Um, I am a very creative person. I mm -hmm. have um, a true passion for arts and um, like DIY projects. Right. Nice. So, yeah, it's, I know it's I tell people all the time, they're like, what? So um, it all started and stemmed from my mother telling me and my sister we were spoiled. And we were ungrateful mm -hmm. when we were younger and sent us off to Mexico to build a house. And really? <laughs> she did. Wow. And so we had to build a house. That was the first time I learned how or what stucco was mm -hmm. um, because we were we were on the East Coast and you send me to the West where they use brick and stucco. Um, mm -hmm. I learned how to mix stucco, how to apply it mm -hmm. um, and working with chicken wire, had no clue that chicken wire is the base of stucco. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually transitioned me into, you know, loving to paint, loving to build, um, you know, creating t-shirts, little figures here and there that you can put around your house. Um, so whenever I get a free moment, that's, that's what I, that's what I'm doing besides traveling. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. That's very, very interesting. I mean, I have a, I, I, I've been fortunate to build myself, so I have a passion for build. And um, it's not easy, you know, when you get the foundation in and the rebirth and it comes together, it starts looking nice. And you're like, mm, well, we might want to move the door here or um, we don't like where the bathroom is. It's, but it all together, it's really nice um, when you get a group of people together and manage a, a build project. It's awesome. So that resonates really well with me. Um, but what about sports? football oh man my friends would laugh um they always do I'm a bandwagon okay. I wait until um the last two teams whether it's football basketball wherever I wait yeah. to the last two teams I pick a team um okay. and that's who I'm rooting for okay. I don't um I don't necessarily go for what whoever one else is going for I'll do some quick research, nothing detailed like what I do, you know, in my my day job and night jobs, right? But um, I just do a, a quick search to see how the team performed, who's on the team, um, if they're young, if they're, um, you know, seasoned as a team. And then I just pick one and I go for it. Sometimes I win, majority of the time I lose. But okay. um, yeah, I need to pick a team though. I need to pick a team. Yeah, you should, you should. <laughs> Let me ask you, who were you rooting for this year? The Giants? No. I, I, All right. I said that because I'm a Giants fan. <laughs> um, but no, so we had the Chiefs and the Eagles in, in the Super Bowl. Um, and what teams did you pick? 
Yeah, I went for the Chiefs. Did you? I did. It's interesting. That is. Was there any particular reason why? I looked at the colors. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Yeah. Um, and then the Eagles, I feel like they always go. Like they're they're always um, you know, they're a season team. And mm. so I was like, okay, well, I feel like the underdogs, they might just win. Yeah. 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 I went for the Chiefs as well. I mean, Mahomes is my guy. So, you know, I'm so glad they won. Um, but I was fortunate to be in Philly when the Eagles were playing once. Really? Yes. And I tell you, I was trying to get back to the airport and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. You think going through the line at JK, JFK is bad. Try going through Philly when the Eagles are playing. It is not the one. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was a disappointing game. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, being on the East Coast, you know, you probably kind of felt it from the disappointment on that side. But hey, um, yeah, we did. All right, another question: iPhone or Android? iPhone all day. Good. All right, all right. And so you talk about travel. I mean, any fun places you've been or would like to go? Yeah. So um, I was just in Jamaica um, back in November. Um, I, I love Jamaica, the the hospitality, mm -hmm. the food options, um, just the the free spirit of the entire island is is like no other. Yes. Um, I want to go to Africa. I, mm -hmm. Honestly, I want to spend probably about a good at least two to four weeks in Africa yep. um, to touch several um, parts. I know a lot of people are like, oh, go to Dubai, go to Johannesburg, go here, go there. And so I, I do want to make a full um, commitment to going. Mm -hmm. And one day soon, I, I'll definitely go. I had the opportunity to go when I was in high school, mm -hmm. uh, but my, my family, they just couldn't afford to pay for it. So it was either send me to Africa for a week with my, my high school friends mm -hmm. and um, the band that I was in or pay for my first year of college. And I said, I guess I'm going to college. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you just throw me there. You were in a band. I was. Take a wild guess of what instrument. Saxophone, trombone, drums. I was section leader. Excellent. Drums as in the snare drum or the full drum kit? Yeah, so it was snare drum. Um, okay. But I started on the tenor drum only because okay. I, I love the... I love the accents of the tenor um, mm -hmm. to the bass drum. And so yeah. um, tenor drums, We, when I was section leader there, I was ultimately trying to combine the rudimental fundamentals of the snare and putting it into the tenor. Because mm -hmm. um, long story short, I started on snare and sucked badly. Um, and the the percussion instructor said, Oh, well, you know, Miss Pruitt, that was my maiden name. Um, you know, well, you know, Miss Pruitt, you know, you're just not cutting it. You're not cutting it. And I said, Oh, and I'm sitting there crying my little eyes out. And I just said, I quit, right? And um, he said, No, uh, you can't quit. And he spoke to my dad, right? And I showed up to my dad's car and I'm just crying. He's my who hurt my baby. And mm. I said, you know, they're they're kicking me off and I just quit and it's just so hard. And so he goes to talk to the instructor and I'm thinking my dad had my back, right? I'm just like, yeah, I'm just, I'm his baby girl. He's got my back. And they came back and said, you'll be at practice tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I share that in my, in my book, Risk It All as well. Um, about so you're dropping all the gems now at the book. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, I like that. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, my book, Risk It All, Wounds to Wisdom, I talk about things that I experienced as a child up until 2020 mm -hmm. um, as a business owner that helped me prepare for the business owner I am today mm -hmm. and the leader and the team that I that I manage and I lead because um, we are, we're a firm of um, eight people and we service clients in over 30 states and two countries currently and have the ability to service all states, right? And so um, I had several people that asked me, you know, Alicia, how do you do it? Where did you learn this skill? And I tell people all the time, you learn these skills since you were little, mm -hmm. right? And it's just a matter of applying those skills 
and combining them with the other skills that you've learned um, as a child to a teenager to an adult and Mm -hmm. using all of that. So I pulled several instances, um, circumstances and situations um, that helped me identify what worked best in business and Mm -hmm. why I'm so strategic in how I do business, who I do business with, um, because it's so important, right? Because that's where you hear so many people, um, mostly your celebrities, that just kind of just fall after they hit some type of peak. And mm-hmm. it's because they did something, said something, or aligned themselves with someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and things just started falling. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I break down those different situations um, that I, in a sense, I put myself in, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I learned from those mistakes. I learned from those situations. I'm a big person that learns from other people's mistakes. Mm-hmm. I can watch you make your mistake. I'll never make it myself, mm-hmm. right? I'm not the the hard head person or the, the soft butt person that's like, oh, I got to do it myself. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, so ultimately, for all those people that are out there that want to start a business, um, to learn how these different, these 18 situations and challenges um, that I experienced and how they made me the business owner I am today to make these decisions, to lead my team, um, you know, to be a faith leader. And um, it's, it's all part of it. And yes, there's training that needs to be done continuously, but mm-hmm. a, at least the foundation and the base of running your business, you already learned. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for several people that have read my book about um, these 18 challenges of an entrepreneur, they're just like, Alicia, I resonate exactly what you're sharing, right? I've been in certain situations where I learned not to be around these people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I didn't know that a situation within my family would have prepared me for this. And, you know, it's some of those things that we kind of just block out mm-hmm. of our day to day memory because we're like, it hurts to think about it. Or sometimes it's um, it's it's not just a happy thought. Right. But of course, I highly recommend everyone for counseling and therapy. It's you know, it's it's really great. And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of times we have to truly face the things that we've experienced so that we can be better going forward instead of sweeping it under a rug, putting a mask over it, or just ignoring it all together. Mm-hmm. Um, because we have so many skills as humans and our experiences in life help shape everything that we do and how we do it. And it's so important for all of us to tap into our own geniuses Um, because a lot of times we're paying for these courses, we're paying for this, paying for that. And then once you get in, you're like, I kind of already knew that, or I feel like that was really basic. And more than likely it was, right? If you would have just tapped into yourself Mm -hmm. and thought about what happened to me in high school, what happened to me in college, what happened to me at my first apartment, right? Just little skills, right? Did I have a dog? What did I do? How did I manage that dog, right? Or did I have siblings? Was I the oldest? Was I the youngest, right? Mm -hmm. So the easy steps um, in situations that all of us have been in at least once or twice somewhere, um, whether it's friendships or dating, um, all of those skills help us for today as business owners. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I actually know now why you became um, a certified tax coach. Um, And I'm a personal believer. I told you this is I think that everybody should have a mentor in their life, whether it's from a relationship, whether it's from work, business, um, every facet of your life should have someone that you can go to and be have a pillar of support. Um, and you know, being a true entrepreneur as you are, I think you can wear several hats and not just be a tax mentor, but you can also help them develop that business as well because you've seen it, you've been through it, the conversations resonate. So you understand, right, let's get your LLC sorted prior to that. Where's your business plan? Do you need the business plan? Have you got your bank account? Do you need the bank account? Do you have and all of these things will set you up for success. So I mean, you are, um, I must say, a true 
entrepreneur, Alicia. I've really, really enjoyed talking to you and I wish we can continue to talk. I think we should do a part two to this um, where we talk more about your book itself and you know what you say resonates with me because if any business that we have been in um, and tell me, correct me if I'm wrong any business that we have been in it relates back to our early beginnings and what we experienced and what we saw anything that we run away from it's not because of the business may not be doing well or is doing well it's from what we experience and if you can tap into that then you'll set yourself up for greatness. And having the right people around you as well, it's so important. And my mentor always says to me, hey, come on, get out of your own head. Who's stopping you from doing this? And I look around, he's like, yeah, nobody, yourself. Keep going. Um, and I think that's very important to have that voice. I would love us to be able to promote your book for you. If you have a link, uh, please send that over and we can kind of put it in the comments for you as well. And also, I would love you to tell me and everybody else how we reach out to you and experience more greatness for yourself. Absolutely. So I honestly, I post every single day, every okay. single day. Um, that's probably one of the, the few things I'm consistent with on social media. Um, so on, on all social media platforms, uh, my name is Tax Advise Her, and I'll spell that. That's T A X. A, D as in dog, B as in Victor, I, Z as in xylophone, H, E, R. So that's tax advice, her, I am her. So um, just to follow me on all of those platforms, um, if you send a direct message to me, that is not a robot, that is not my assistant, that is me, that is responding. Um, if or whenever we get to that point, I'll let you guys know that it's not me, right? But for for the most part, it is me. I do respond to um, questions. And if it requires um, more details, then I will send you a link for us to schedule um, a longer call. And um, But for the most part, Tax Advise Her, I post every single day there. And of course, I have the um, the link and the connection in my bio to Distinct Taxes page, and that's Distinct Tax Consulting um, on all platforms as well. That's LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Um, same thing for Tax Advise Her. Uh, we post every single day, and um, you get a ton of value um, just from the postings. We share information. We give you details. We also have um, you know, giveaways that we give um, usually within the first 10 days of every month. We we always have a free giveaway for everyone um, so that you all can be great in what you do. And, you know, I do understand that every business owner um, cannot afford, you know, an accountant or may not be able to afford a bookkeeper. But my my passion and my will and my hope is that the information we do share with you on these social media platforms that you all can use this information to apply it to your business until you get to that point where you can't afford you know, to pay someone to do this for you. Um, but in the meantime, to use the resources that you currently have, and we love to be that resource. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, look forward to speaking to you again. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. All right. And that's another episode of The Entree. Thank you for listening. Okay, so we're done. The recording has stopped. You could have kept recording, I don't mind, but we're done. And that was just awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That was just awesome. Like a lot, I could keep talking to you because it resonates with me, you know. So I have a, um, and I just come back from Africa two weeks ago and I'm actually going back. I'm going to, yeah. on Saturday, literally just confirmed about a couple hours ago, I'm going to Ghana on, um, on Sunday for a week. And um, you know, I travel, my brother's just come from a safari in Kenya with my nephew. Uh, oh, yeah, so and I want to do that as well. My best friend moved. Um, so he's half Zambian. I, I'm not sure if I told you, he's half Zambian, half Dutch. And um, the Dutch side have just moved to Zambia and started pig farming. Um, so yeah, so, yeah. So you literally, you know, just like, and so like, so he's half Zambian, half Dutch, and I'm like, case man your dad's caucasian how's he doing all of this he's like he loves it he just loves it um uh -huh. which is great and so i'm hoping to do a lot more in tanzania this year as well so i'm hope maybe we can you know who knows 
connect online and I can share with you some of those stories as well. Um, yeah, yeah it would be awesome. But I can talk to you all day long about accounting because it really is the base of everything. Um, because you're spending money every single day. You're buying your laptop, your mobile phone. Um, even if you got a $30 return each month from your mobile phone, that's yeah. a lot of money. That's a gym membership. So for and maybe that you could then start offsetting your gym membership. And so you just got to be very smart in yeah. how you do things and be correct. And I don't think people know about that enough. I think they know about the glamour. They know about let's go and get a G Wagon for 180, how however much it costs, and let's go and drive. You know, I would love to have a G Wagon outside my house, but I don't want one outside my house not because, because there's no need i can think of a hundred other things you know yeah, uh, yeah i agree i have a and it's so it's so funny that you even mentioned a g-wagon i have a client that bought a g-wagon well her story to me was oh yeah i went and bought a g-wagon for my birthday and i'm like you bought a g-wagon mm -hmm. and she's like yeah 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 i'll send you over the documents send me over you leased a g-wagon Right. And it's a whole nother ball game. But with her leasing versus buying, now she has to pay an additional, we have to, well, not pay, but we have to include um, some of that that lease payment as income because you're over that threshold of of making money. So leasing a a um a vehicle at this point in your life, it costs you more money than to buy it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, she is one of our all-inclusive clients, but she just started just making her own decisions. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now she has to include, I think it's at least like three months worth of payments. Um, and that G-Wagon payment, I think it's somewhere that's between right. five and 8,000 a month. And it's just like, a month. why, why, <laughs> you know, you could, I, get, um, you could get a house. Um, I mean, I look at a one. house. Listen, with a with an airport, yeah. You, I mean, I looked at this mansion in um in the middle of Arizona and it had an airport hangar and everything, and the mortgage payment was like six, seven thousand a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she has three houses now. Yeah, because we 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 um, bought two last year. Mm. Um, then she had another one some years before. We'll probably get another piece of real estate this year, but it's just it. It, it's just crazy when people, um, which is why it's um, it's inspiring me to write a different book, because yeah. um, when people get into money, mm -hmm. they they don't understand their relationship with money. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you finally understand your relationship with money and I understand your relationship with money, I then understand how you're operating your business. Yeah. Right. Um, because a lot of people say, oh, I've never had this much money before. So because you never had it and now you do have it, you're going crazy with it. And next thing you know, you went from having a million dollars in the bank and being that millionaire to the next day, you yeah, now exactly. only have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. And I know a lot of people have heard this story from Shaq, right? Yeah, or, yeah he went out and, and spent, yeah. And, and what was it? I think a day or so or a couple of hours. Day, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and so, you know, this client was the same way. And I and I said, well, have you heard Shaq's story? Yeah. And the client was like, uh, no, I don't think I heard it. And I said, no worries. I'm about to play it for you. Yeah. And so, you know, during in the middle of the meeting, because it was so important for this client to hear that mm -hmm. information, that it resonated. And at that point, you know, the client's like, I'm doing exactly what Shaq just did. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I found another video just popped up on my timeline or whatnot um, last week. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot the, the celebrity name, but um, no, ultimately. T-Pain hmm? T -Pain, T -Pain did the same thing. It, it could have been T-Pain. And it uh, ultimately was saying that, you know, my net worth is this, but I don't have access to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so and that's true. Right. Especially when we talk about tax planning. Um, we, we change them into income producing assets, but the thing is you don't have access to go and cash out those assets, not yeah. right away, at least you have yeah. to hold them for maybe 10 to 15 years and yeah. you're getting a little bit of the money back, you know, every year. 
um, some of it every month. But mm. ultimately, he was like, if I could cash out on all that stuff, I'd probably be broke. And I wouldn't have a net worth. No, you yeah. wouldn't. You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and it's so true because, you know, I don't know if I told you, I, I was fortunate to buy my first house like in 202. It was crazy. Like I was that millionaire. Do you understand? And literally yeah. in a space of 24, 36 months, I went from zero or I went from being out there to being doing whatever I'm doing, like legitimately, and then having it all. You know, I had two, I mean, I had like two or three cars. Like, you know, I had, I've got, I still have it. I've got, you know, two story penthouse. Um, you know, I, and then all of a sudden the crash happens. And, you know, you didn't have the right advisors, the right uh, mortgage brokers. Your interest rates are going up. You know, so you've gone from making five grand a month to now spending 15 a month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you're now, and your friends quite quickly disappear around you and you have to learn how to pivot. And we saw, and we know there's so many people who came through, um, you know, some are not, no longer here, you know, like the biggest ones, you know, a lot of wealthy people. Some came, I, I, I know of, it was in the news, it was a really rich guy, you know, he just basically barricaded his whole entire family and set a light the mansion because he couldn't take it. Um, but that's because they had the wrong information. All of these things, if you have the right information, you're not going to go out and buy three cars. I, I had nowhere to park these vehicles, I'm telling you. <laughs> I had nowhere to park them and I could only drive one. <laughs> right, right. And so if we fast forward and we look at it now as the businesses or this come even swiftly in, in the business that we run, is we're raising capital. Mm -hmm. I said to the team last week, yeah, okay, so you're going to, um, the individual, you're going to sign over a check. It's not for a lot, it's more like 25,000. We don't need the money. We, any money we get just needs to stay in the bank account. We don't need to spend it. We don't, it's good to have it. When investors look at us, we've got liquid. But if you told me this some years ago, I'd be like, right, we get 25 grand, let's go and buy five iPhones. Everyone, everyone can, everyone Everyone's going to Vegas type of situation. But you, you've got to be really smart. And I think that's really allowed us to grow um, as a team, mm -hmm. uh, build the product that we have, but also me as an individual. And, and surely you um, surely as well, which is why you, you write the book. Through these experiences, you don't want to repeat them in the other businesses. Going to read accounting was because I wanted those businesses to grow. And I mean, I wish, you know, that... There is some where we have you, um, but if these, as your client, you know, she's got all that money. If they just come and talk to someone who's had a bit of experience, don't buy the car. I mean, out here we can lease it, right? Because in the US, because I was talking to a guy in, in, in Porsche in Scottsdale, and it's slightly different, but we call it a lease. So when I lease it here, I can offset it against the business. If I buy it, then it's kind of personal. In the US, it's slightly, slightly different, but I don't own the car now. So I have a corporate account with Avis and whoever, and it goes under my travel expenses. Yeah, yeah. And you can do that same thing. I have one client who doesn't own a car, mm -hmm. but um, he uses um, Uber and Lyft to yeah. get around, you know, and it's just like, hey, I'm fine with this. And then also has a personal driver for when he doesn't want to use Uber and Lyft, right? That's and that true. personal driver is available um, as long as, you know, they, they schedule it or whatnot. And I think that's, that's awesome. But, you know, some people are like, what? That's expensive. We did an analysis, Cameron. Mm. It was literally about the same, maybe a two to $5,000 difference. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. It's, and it's the, not a big difference. It's not. And when you're doing your accounts, you can write that off. So you're yeah. paying for it. It's zero. It's free. Yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of my family members look at me now and they're like, oh, you got a new car. I'm like, yeah. But because I'm not paying for it, I'm yeah. not, literally not paying for it. I can drive from my home to the meeting, or and and vice versa. And I being in London, you park your car and you walk everywhere, right? I get the comfort of having a brand new vehicle. Someone else has to worry about liability. Right. Um, so I just got back from Amsterdam the day before yesterday. I haven't got a car because I'm not going anywhere for the next four days. But next week they deliver me a new car. And a week after and a week. And that's yeah. how you're supposed to run your business. As you talked about, be efficient, you know, let it pay you. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, no, you know, I can talk to you about this because you you do this. Um, so, and I uh, like this. I tell people all the time, I could talk about this all day yeah. long, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, even with me, and I, I intentionally asked you that R&D question. I mean, we did it with our business here, but we're looking at, I'm looking into it for North America, because the only challenge I have is that, and I should have asked you this on 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 the um, on the call, but is, you know, when you start a business, you, the business has no money. So effectively, you are the financier. So when it comes to then evidencing that information sometimes it's like well i had a thousand dollars in my pocket and i just went and bought the ipads or um and so this is all or i had two thousand dollars and i paid for the conference but you didn't go to the conference for you you went to the conference for the business and so now you then have and i wish i did but now you didn't have the challenge of well i spent 50 grand for this building this business out of my own funds and so i'm writing a debt to an iou to the business you need to really show and demonstrate to the IRS that you're not just trying to take 50 grand. And this this is like where, um, but I'm glad that also never because it then gives you the opportunity to hopefully if you get some leads to be able to kind of get under the skin of that. But so that's something that I will be doing anyway. And I mean, we will um, maybe come to you. I mean, I've got my CFO, but Bill, um, maybe we'll come to you and just work with you um, in, in that regard because we're going to launch in Ohio. Uh, in, what part in Ohio? We're doing Cleveland and Columbus. Okay. We're Cleveland, Columbus, uh, with um, a VC and uh, um, one of the guys actually. I'll tell you his name. His name is Vic Gideon. This guy from Channel 19, who's our ambassador as well. So we do, but we got one July or one September as the date. As it's looking out, I think it's probably going to be one September. Everything's in place already. It's just more about us doing, you know, the the wine and cheese launch, rooftop party, hundred and fifty, whatever. And right, getting, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's just about how soon Vic can get that done. So if we can get that done, I, I think that, you know, as long as the numbers stack up, we can just get you to work with the guys in Ohio. Because Ohio's, although it's going to be part of our business, it's really separate and just sharing this with right. you. It's yeah. a very kind of like important part for, for me because whilst we're not franchised in Ohio, I want the guys to almost operate it as if it's their own territory and right. giving them all that infrastructure to do so. And what that does for me is it takes the weight off my shoulders. So I don't have to worry about it. And they also appreciate that and they will build the business. Um, and so yeah. I would definitely love to talk to you about that um, and whatever information you need to know uh, about Columbus and Cleveland, um, I'm happy to share with you as well. And, you know, we've got some figures in that we want to, to generate in revenue and yeah, right, right. You guys can, I can sync you up with Bill and myself and they can we take it from there as well. Yeah, I would say let's set it up. Um, and, you know, whether it's on, on Zoom or if they want me to meet with them in person or we can start there and whatnot, because I travel every mm-hmm. month. I go somewhere every month at least, sometimes twice a month. But um, yeah, that's where we can start the conversation and then see um, what help they need. And even if it's, you know, just some advisory of what needs to be done, how it needs to be done um, and see, you know, what all needs to be put in place so that, you know, that they're compliant. Um, And then, of course, whatever agreement that you all have that you're getting the information you need from them as an extension of you. Right. Um, Yeah. Because I've I've seen some um, there's a there's a franchise here, um, it's it's a pizza franchise, it was a small one, mm-hmm. um, but it has so much potential and it just didn't work out. But the problem was the franchisees weren't paying the proper amounts, and um, the initial owner or the franchisor um, or whatnot they they didn't know how to track it right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm telling them like, hey, we need to put this in place, do this, 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 and they're like. Oh, Alicia, it's so expensive to do that. And I said it is, but it's even more expensive to not collect on the money that you're supposed to be making. Yeah. Right. Because you have your royalties, you have um, if there's marketing fees, whatever it may be that you all all included in here, franchise fees or whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. You got to make sure that you can collect on that properly and you have that that connection. So, um, you know, we just want to make sure that all that's right. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, what I don't, what it is, is we're not going to go. We're not going down the franchise route because of the the rigmarole. You know, you, there's a lot of red tape in the US for franchise. But I want them to have that kind of operate as if they are. I yeah. Just want them to have. Um, and I would love to talk to you about it in real good detail. And I think it's about a month away. And okay. the reason being is we have um, kind of like spring break or two weeks. The kids have two weeks. I'm going to spend two weeks off with them as well. It's just kind of like their, you yeah. know, their promised thing next week. Um, so I'm going to have some downtime. But April okay. of May onwards, I'll be all over Ohio. Um, I'll be in the US as well um, then. So I'll be in the US in May and June and then September. So I've okay. um, been to Atlanta physically in atlanta yet so maybe you might get me to get into georgia and experience it but i've been told not to because people don't know how to drive properly it it, it gets crazy and you know there's certain times of the day i recommend not to drive mm -hmm. um only because it's not you it's really them it, yeah fully and honestly right yeah. um because they're paying attention to their phones they're thinking about work um, they're stressed about whatever, mm -hmm. and they're just driving on autopilot and they just ram into people and, and it's just like, oh, I'm such a safe driver, but it's not you. Yeah. They're they're just not thinking because there's so many moving parts in Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, it's unlike any of the other metropolitan areas in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. where people are probably more mentally OK. Mm -hmm. um, and in Georgia, the cost of living used to be really cheap, right? And so now the cost of living has increased, but their mm -hmm. salaries haven't increased. So, you know, they're they're dealing with a lot of these things and you have certain area codes and zip codes, sorry, not area codes, sorry. You have different zip codes um, that I know like Operation Hope talks about all the time, but you have various zip codes where it's like, if you drive over that way, just know that you're probably going to get into an accident. Mm -hmm. You know, just yeah. they have a lot of a lot of things. And there's more of those areas than there are the really good ones. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it just it kind of yeah. sucks and it's masked. Right. So they look like really great areas, but mm -hmm. their debt to income ratios are high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just stressed. They make good money, but they don't know how to manage it. And I'm just that that helper in me and the financial part of me are like, can we just put this together and help everybody? But it's an easy you know, fix, but you it's see, not easy. and this is why I think maybe we should do a second, if you want, do a second kind of conversation. Really, it's sort of like when you talked about the relationship with money, it's economics and economics is the management of a household, but they mask it in the way of, okay, economics, what we think is, oh, it's a global thing. It's not. It's how do I manage myself? How do you manage you? And that's, you know, whether I'm going to the gym or, you know, whether I'm spending or set, it's literally how we manage this. And we can create our own economy. And I, I, I think, green is it Green Bank? Green, Greenwoods. Greenwoods is doing a, a mm -hmm. really, really, really good kind of story. And they've, they've come up so far. I've been following them yeah. since they started. Thanks. Telling that story, right? Telling that story. We have it all. Mm -hmm. We you have do. it all. And you don't, I don't need to go and borrow money. Yeah. And I don't know if I told you how I rebuilt Swiftly. I built Swiftly with no money, second time around, literally with no money. But it was because I sold a house. I had a house in Europe. I sold it. I put it all in the business. Now I came back here. I got this place. I was making lots of money. We're doing about I don't know, it's about $10,000, $11,000 a month myself bringing in. And then all of a sudden COVID happened. You know, we had 400 grand at yeah. the table. And so the next phase was like, man, I've just sold real estate that I promised myself. And I said to the kids, I'm never going to sell this. This is yours forever. Blah, blah, blah. Sold it, gambled on myself. Now COVID's happened. And what do I do? And I realized then, and been actually building this like we have it all and we don't need to and life technically in the ancient days was operating on a barter system and we know this you know then they invented gold well not invented then they sort of was pegged on gold and then currency then became money for the usd but if we really go back and look at that barter system where you know you and i have just had this conversation we've recorded 
Now it's going to be posted on LinkedIn and whatever. You then get something. It's a trade and we trade. And if we continue to trade, we don't even need to exchange funds because we right. all get to where we need to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and this is, you know, this is how I built the dev team. Uh, the additional dev, dev team was literally that was, hey, look, you've got experience in digital marketing, sales, whatever. Can you help us redo our literature or perhaps whatever? And then we might be able to give you a system a systems admin for three months. Let's do it. Get, a, get to where you want to be. So I think if you want, maybe in the future, whenever your calendar is available, we can plan maybe myself, you and another. We can do and uh, just have a conversation because I think people need to be educated, but educated in the right way. Um, yeah. It's so important. And as you said, giving them the free nuggets, but actually if you did a workshop, I don't know how you do, you know, 30 minutes, 20 minutes on the phone, they are more likely, and I, from my side, is I'm more likely to come back to you, you tell me or not, more likely to come back to you when they realize that, well, at least you told me A, B, and C, I've looked at it, I'm due a $5,000 return. They're not going to go to someone else because they know that if they go to someone else, they're going to have to start and they'll probably come back to you. And that's where you know, yeah. the, the money starts rolling in. Absolutely. So, I mean, Cameron can talk about a lot and talk a lot. So, um, I will pause. Um, and if you want me to go, I'm quite happy. If you want to stay, I've got another, I've got some minutes. It's holiday here today. So, oh, that's um, right. Well, I guess, well, ours was Friday. Um, no, no, no. It's, we would definitely need to reconnect because I do have a, a meeting here at 1 15. Uh, yeah. so I would say if we can, um, I'm gonna look at my calendar and yep. see when, when's the next day we can reconnect. Cause I know we have our tax day next week. Um, but I, I should be more available after, I think it's what, Tuesday or Wednesday. So, okay. um, yeah, I would say let's reconnect then. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. But I'm all free from the 8th of May as well, because I'm, I'm kind of winding down for the kids holiday. So if you want. 8th of May onwards will be even better for me okay. uh, in terms of time. And um, I'll make sure that we get this up and running for you on LinkedIn. Um, Cause you're going to send me the video. Or I might be able to get access it as well. Yep. I'll send it to you as soon as we hang up. Cause it'll um, fathom usually we'll have it ready, but I'm going to send you both. Yeah. Um, Cause as long as my fathom is here, it recorded the entire time. Um, but then I'm also going to send you the zoom that cut off at. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we'll get up on fr up for you by Friday. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good then. Thank you so much. Enjoy talking to you. All right. Same here. Take care. Bye-bye.